So welcome everybody. Here it's Sylvie Barbier and Valérie Duvauchel. You guys might know about Valérie. She's uh, a center figure at the Bergerac Hub. And we are here doing an interview uh, on our series called Once Upon a Time in our quest of finding out what makes certain people out of the ordinary. And uh, so Valérie, it's a real privilege for having you today. I'm very excited to get to interview you. And, and for people who might have never met you or don't know much about you, I'd love you to present yourself, say a little bit about who you are and what are you currently up to? Wow. Thank you, Sylvie. Same here. Pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, who am I? I think I will skip this one because I... <laughs> After 50 years of something, I don't think I'm, I'm still able to answer this question, but what I'm doing, maybe I can try that. As you said, I am a co-founder of the Bergerac Praxis Hub with two other person. And basically, since uh, we started last year, uh, but from this year, we, we're trying to aim to um, what it is to become human again. What, what does it take for us to activate our natural compassion, our joy? Uh, to um, to be together among humans, but uh, with everything. And what does it mean? What are the strategy? Uh, uh, we are really embedded in the contemplative activism, like how what is the root of actions to um, how action comes, you know, not from our mind, but from a state of, um, yeah, natural connection or whatever. And I am personally interested in how to activate this inclusive sense of self uh, maybe we could say uh, through food so i'm uh, yeah i'm i'm passionate about uh, how to bring food uh, propose food uh, in all the way we can uh, use food buying eating cooking as a transformative tool as much as a regulating circle meditation um so yeah so I'm a Tenzo in, um, in the Zen tradition. Yes. So can you say a little bit about what is a Tenzo in the Zen tradition? Because some people who are listening to us might know more or less about what is a Tenzo. And so that would be really great to have you explain to us a little bit what is a Zen Tenzo chef. Yeah. So it's, it's coming specifically from the Zen tradition, but... Um, I would say it's it's a perspective where we address food as a way to become alive at every moment. So, and etymology, the, the, the Tenzo is somebody who give the place, who, who, who repair the connection. So giving the place meaning that, um, he, he allows the people who eat, for example, in community, to really feel that they are eating, uh, meaning that they, 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 they create a condition that they will distract themselves uh, less in order to be able to, to be with all uh, that is around us more. And that goes from... Um, um, a, a, a specific way to cook where actually the taste is not so um, destructive, uh, like there is spices, but there is actually it's in the lineage of the Chinese tradition because the Zen, as I learned it from Japan, is coming from Chinese where there is the five elements. So there is the things where they are careful to balance the savor in order to give the people kind of a plain taste. And that brings um, kind of a different kind of nourishment, but it also goes with uh, their own practice of when they cook, they're not just concentrated in the food. They have a 360 degree. Uh, so it's, it's a practice of um, integration, of um, being able to be aware of what's going on every time. It's, it's again, uh, how to be alive. And the Tenzo do it with the cooking, when the people are eating, when he is cooking, uh, as much as, uh, I don't know, the, the, the master of meditation will do it with uh, 
helping people to concentrate in the meditation hall and the person in charge of the cleaning will do it in helping people to be concentrate when they do cleaning so yeah yeah amazing and well i'd love to hear a little bit um well eventually i will ask you a little bit how did you got to uh no actually i'm gonna ask it now so um uh, i'd love to know how did when and how did you encounter zen what has been your uh path in touching zen uh yes um oops pardon i um didn't search for zen <laughs> Uh, let's say I was in France in a, to make it short, um, in a very bad uh, psychological state where I was literally living, I think, for six months in a panic attacks and um, couldn't barely get out of my, my, my apartment. Um, I had um, um, drinking problems before and I had stopped. And uh, actually it was worse. And to the point where I thought to myself, uh, so I don't have actually, it's not a drinking problem. It's something bigger. Like I have really not the capacity to live in this world. And I was in this stage and I don't know why, but I remember that my mother who used to be a yoga teacher mentioned that once she went to a place where her teacher uh, met uh, the previous residency, we could say, which was the Shimaru, the one we brought then in, in France, and that she remembered that he was always laughing and blah, blah. And I don't know, I remember that, and I checked where was a Zen center nearby, and I went, and uh, I found that profoundly stupid, uh because they didn't really talk to me they just say sit i didn't have any problem with sitting because i i was sitting with my mother and it was something normal in our house it lasted i don't know 40 minutes and uh and then i wake up and they were like oh da -da, you you they were all in black you want to have a coffee and i said no I <laughs> like i really find that really stupid you know like nothing happened i leave and then something magic happened. It took me about two hours to notice. I was stuck in what we call, you know, like when everything is a priority. So it overwhelms you and you can't do anything because it's too much. And then you go back to bed, basically. And then after six months, just have, it took me a while to connect. But then I start to have the priority uh, being back in order. So I knew what I have to do next and next and next. And it's kind of a click me. And uh, voila, so this and uh, one, and then little by little, that's it. I, I was there. So I started to go uh, once a week, something like that. And then I left to Japan. And six months after, to make it short, I find myself in the same situation, completely overwhelmed. I'm in Japan. I don't speak too much Japanese yet everything is so complicated and I'm like for some reason I didn't know I still don't know to this day why but I brought a zafu to go to Japan <laughs> so like the cushion so I remember when I'm in this stage that I remember it happened once and that something happened when I sat so I took my zafu and I sat and of course I couldn't and I started a dance very bothering dance where I say, okay, I have to sit uh, 20 minutes every morning. So of course I couldn't. And it was worse because I couldn't wake up to sit. I felt guilty. I go back to bed. And the next day it was, it took me like, and at one point I decided that um, whatever the time I would sit and there, and I did that. And that's how I started to sit. And I have to say that there was a lot of days where I'm sure that I sit exactly 20 seconds, but I was sitting. I didn't care about the time. I was sitting every morning, even if it was one second. One day I watched my watch, it was 20 minutes. I, I was surprised. And then I realized that I was in Japan, that the country of the <laughs> just sitting. It was a bit stupid that I sit in my room, uh, not knowing I was not interested in Buddhism. I was just... Well, I got something out of the experience, that's all. But eventually I found a temple and by chance, 
I end up in the biggest uh, temple, the second biggest temple in the Zen Soto, uh, uh, Sojiji. And I started to go there every week. I started to do the retreat uh, quite quickly. And I still was interested in, in uh, Buddhism. And I, it was great for me because I, I wasn't speaking Japanese at that time. So I wasn't listening anything about Buddhism. I just sat and I was attracted by the energy of the monks. Like I, I felt they were like a dancer and like the way they were walking. I don't know, I was like uh, completely attracted. And even though it took me about... Uh, two hours every Sunday to go, you know, I was taking my, my train, I was so happy. And when I was entering the temple, I don't know, there was so much life. I was attracted by life. You know, I, I could see like every time I was crossing a monk, he, he, he was looking at me, you know, like he, I, I, I wasn't finding that in the city, you know, so I was attracted by life. And that's why I came back and came back. And, um, and then I discovered the, the specific uh, Tenzo practice, the food, all the rituals, all the effects uh, during the, the retreat uh, when I started to go to Sojiji yeah, in 2003 or something like that. Wow, amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that. And why I also really hear is that for many people, often moments of transformation, we have to touch like the mud before we let the lotus blossom. And I really hear there were like moments of the mud before your, your lotus arrived. And I'd love to, you know, when you said something of like, I like the experience of I couldn't live in this world. You mentioned, you said something along those lines. Like, um, what about this world uh, that you you couldn't live with in the sense that maybe there was a certain value system, a certain view about humanity and the world that was existing in, in the mainstream system that I have a sense that you didn't maybe feel as aligned with, maybe not even so much aware. What was that view and versus what is your now current view? Um, yeah, it's funny. I've, actually, I didn't notice, but since you asked the question, you know, I said that the Tenzo literally is the, the people who give the order, not order in an authoritarian place, but like how can people get back their place in the world in order with everything else, like everybody has this place and we're part or all. And that's kind of a, the, the etymology of, uh, of Tenzo. And for me, yes, as you said, I wasn't conscious of the value system. I just feel that I couldn't find my place. That this world, so I, it was kind of reverse. This world had no place for me, or like I, I have, I was a mistake, and I wasn't equipped. I didn't, I didn't have what it take to to to. Uh, be in this world but I was never a punk you know and or I was never very political so believe it or no but I took for the norm what was presented to me and I was a mistake mm. you know, around. That, yeah. that's why I felt so <clears throat> you know so so broken for so many years because I was sure this everything was normal I couldn't understand it yeah I couldn't understand why people were I don't know, I was so eager to run so much money to have the new car or or like the girls, like they wanted so much to have a husband and like a kind of a pre prefabricated dream. Like I was I was amazed with all those uh, passion which seemed odd to me because like when I when people were asking me what do you want to do? I didn't know. I'm mean, like, I don't know, I will see what comes and so. So not even the the view, not not is not even the system, but the the strategy. I would say the way people would live their life uh, to contribute to the world as it is, it was. I could not understand any of it. So that and can you tell me more. What else couldn't you understand about that world that you were seeing that you felt you didn't have a place in? Well, where else seemed to you just really, for example, quite bizarre? In yeah, well, uh, I, I, first now 
it's, it's thank God it's becoming more in the conversation, but I really felt from a very early age the separation that it seemed that we were in a world with a lot of beings, a lot of elements, uh, and all we were organizing or talking was humans with humans. And that struck me, uh, of course, when I was a kid, obviously quickly with the animals and not even it was human with humans, but we were nasty to others. Uh, to the in the city, I could see like people were throwing things in flowers, or that really struck me. Or like the fact that I was passionate, you know, when I was in vacation by by hints, and I could stay like hours just to to work. I was fascinated, yes, by animal, by the nature, and the and all my girlfriend. I don't know when I was 11, 12, It was all about boys. It was. I, I could see that all the focus was was human related, and I and I felt yeah I always felt yeah that's strange because you know there is flowers there is grass there is hens there is cats there is uh, <laughs> and yeah. So, yeah so I couldn't understand the separation. And you said that you felt that from a very early age. So what maybe value system did your family have? that had you maybe perceive things this way or or you were a kind of anomaly like a glitch yeah well definitely the the anomaly part came when i yeah when i got out of the bubble from my parents because i have to say that i think i had a, a very um open education in a sense that uh, they never directed me in my choice and um, I don't know, my passion for animals were very welcome. I felt always very welcome. And also I felt uh, trusted and all what I was saying was listened. I felt seen, I felt uh, clever. So that's, that's exactly, I mean, the shock, it was a shock. It was when I came to the world starting, I don't know, teenage, because for example, a simple thing, but I trust, what everybody was saying because my parents never lied to me and it took me so long time to realize that it's not because people say things that it's true or that they will do it because this is an and an, it was not in my de cultural dna so so no i guess it's when i yeah there was the value system that they had i don't know they were as i said like my mother was a yoga teacher my my father for was a physiotherapist but they both had uh, gone, and it was quite progressive at that time, a personal journey, like to really uh, dig out their um, trauma, you know, like the, my father did psychoanalysis very seriously for uh, several years. My mother did uh, group dynamics, um, gestalt, uh, you know, at a time where it was quite progressive. So they really cleaned out. They, I think they realized that they, they came with, as we all do, uh, transgenerational uh, uh, trauma, you know, which perpetuates and uh, and they, they decided to break the chain and like to really uh, work on that for several years. And I really have to say, I think I, I benefit uh, from their work. You know, they didn't yeah. project their thing on me very clearly, very clearly. Wow. Yeah. So I well, really hear in a way your background is that like your your parent gave you a lot of space to just be and be yourself and discover your interest and and to cultivate your connection with life and and therefore in which is quite out of the ordinary for most people they they don't experience that childhood that type of childhood but there was also therefore an adjustment to have been able to maybe had a childhood being able to connect so much with life and oneself but seeing that the world does not operate yet that way and trying to find your position, like how to interact with, with you and the, and the world's value system. Yeah. Wow, that's really fascinating. So and that's why that's why there is no ideal education because even when you have a 
<laughs> the ideal education you don't fit when you have a bad you know like that's 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 interesting to to see like sometimes yeah. people say oh i i wish i would be uh i've been better with my child or and i said you know like it, it, it's everybody has to go through the same process at one point and uh yeah yeah i think Definitely, no matter what, people will have to go through their own journey and own suffering to discover themselves. Uh, and I like, I do want to really acknowledge the extraordinary work it sounds like your parents have done, because I think your ability to be out of the ordinary, to have been able to choose an out of the ordinary path, is also because there was a context in which you could pursue this out like a, a different way of perceiving the world that um you weren't crushed too much to to be able to like uh figure out your path um and like can you say a little bit more about how do you how do you see the world like Maybe also the, there's been a, a path in that from, you know, the child who's really connected yeah. with plants and nature and where you are now today running a residency to inquire about how, how to be alive. I yeah. really hear that there's this connection, but I'd love to really understand what is your perception of your worldview, basically? Yeah, yeah. Um... How shall I say again? I will. I will. I, I actually like from teenage to thirty. I think this misplacement, maladjustment to the world, as I had seen then projected in the world, a view where it doesn't work. Um, I could see the bad guys or the, the the things which don't function or the dysfunctionality um i guess i got more and more uncomfortable and uh, especially in the area of it has a consequence in the area of uh, of love or effect i always felt uh, betrayed I, I was basically a victim even if i could see that there was certainly explanation whatever my understanding i was still um a victim of the world or of, of, of my, my lovers, of my friends, of my co-workers, you know, there, there was always something at one point that, yeah, people were not acting right. People didn't recognize what I was doing. And, and I was living in this very uncomfortable, um, yeah, place. And I guess, um, before to answer what is my worldview, so, um, Again, coming back to Zen, I guess for me, it has transformed my life because um, I remember one time I went to a retreat and uh, and that was the worst retreat I ever made because I enter in the retreat where basically you spend your time sitting facing a wall with the obsession of a lover that was not talking to me anymore. And I start to sit and usually I don't have any problem but like, oh my God, I could almost hear the second of each minute of the 11 hours of sitting that I was gonna do. And I was like, that, that, that won't be possible. I'm, 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 I'm too much obsessed. So I can't, I can't disconnect from this, uh, you know, time um, illusion. I can't get in the, in the yeah, detachment of like, let me be myself uh, and not feeling the time anymore. But what happened is like the fourth day of this retreat, so I was still, uh, and then suddenly, literally, I felt something dropped and boom, like within the inside. And then a rush of, uh, of love, like or bliss, or I don't know exactly, like really for everything. And it's always very difficult to translate those because I don't even know exactly what, what's going on. But the effect was at this moment, I didn't even know why I was obsessed with my love affair, why I was sad with my love affair. All what stays was my love for everything, but including for him. 
And the rest didn't matter if I would see me, if he would call me, if, uh, and from that, I think intellectually or as a teaching, like a integrative teaching, I finally see that what was going on externally didn't have anything with my freedom of loving, basically, and, and, and have, being in, in my place with everything. And, and even this thing which was not there was part of the everything. And I don't know, this has really signed a, <clears throat> um, a threshold that I never came back uh, then. And even if I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm realistic. So even if I had this experience, even I, I know that this, you know, victim, this uh, feeling betray is, is such a collective trauma that I don't say that I'm free from that, but I'm free from the fact that I believe that I am that. And I have gained the freedom that when it happened, and it happens still, you know, of course, uh, not as much as before, but it happens. Uh, I have the capacity to remember, eh, t -t 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 this, is, this is your collective trauma. Like, you, you know, you're not what your projection is, and you're certainly not what, yeah, you think is uh, the outside is, and you have this, this freedom. Yeah. And the second thing that has, so it's not that the view of my world have changed, but my capacity to view the world has been uh, transformed in a sense that, um, yeah, in some way I, I can, I, I can, I have the freedom to stop projecting my feelings or my reality in the world and then I have, yeah, it's so it's it's much more cool. And the second the second um, thing which happened, which really um, had a strong strong impression, and which had uh, decided of my passion for the tenzo for the food, is like around the but the same maybe the two or second retreat, the third day, you know, in the tradition like. Um, we eat also where we meditate and there is a ritual like we, we recite the sutra of the food we are grateful for the ancestor ancestor or oh, ancestor etc and at one point you take your bowl of rice and you you, you put it like this in front of you at, at the eyes of with you know same same distance and you continue to to recite something and at this moment I had the something kind of, uh, I didn't know who was looking who, but literally, you know, I had the feeling that the rice was looking at me, was like, like kind of a, you know, fractal stuff. And I like, whoa, and like something again, um, I don't know, the perception of the reality was kind of different regarding time. Then I tasted the rice and the taste of the rice was, surreal because actually it tasted like the you know the smell when a cake is getting out of an oven the smell is even better sometimes than the cake itself and it was the smell of the the cake that certainly was baking my mother I remember that when I was a child and she was baking a lot of cakes and I taste and it tasted that the smell of the cake getting out of an oven and I got like, whoa, what, what that, you know, because I was eating potentially the same rice since four days and it has changed. The taste has not even changed, but it was maybe the most extraordinary things that I've tasted. So then started my journey because I had to find where the kitchen was. I wasn't speaking that much Japanese at that time. So Gigi is a very big temple. I went for the second kitchen, the big one. No, it's the other temple. I finally find the, the cooks and I ask them, did you do something to the rice? <laughs> to understand that, of course, they didn't do anything. It's the same rice that they're cooking since, I don't know, 200 years, years. <laughs> same producer. And then that was the second shift. I was like, whoa, if the taste of rice is not changing because of the rice, what's going on? And wow. you know, so that's the same. It's not the rice I've changed. I didn't send change my my view perception of what a rice is, 
but the way I encountered and I test literally the rise, so it could be the world has changed and potentially can change at you know at every moment. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing this extraordinary story. And what I particularly like about your path is that um, it, it's very embodied and in, in practice. You know, like what I really hear is these um is first an experience happened about being alive. And then from that, there is a, a, an intellectualization. Mm. Uh, that, and, uh, and also what I love in your sharing is really kind of expressing that transformation is something embodied and not just intellectual. And I think specifically with our audience that is probably more Western, there's a tendency to uh, believe that transformation is something first to be intellectual and then embodied uh, or a bit more in the brain, in the mind, rather than in the practice. And, and you touch in certain things are is very Asian tradition, which is like do and you'll understand <laughs> rather than by mm -hmm. understanding, like it's, it's more like you have to do it. And then from that, you'll get a, an insight more than an intellectual understanding mm -hmm. and um uh and, and so what i really see is from that hence your your now uh work in creating the hub which is a place of practice that's why it's a practice hub mm -hmm. it's a place for embodying and ex in the place for experimenting and creating experiences that will create insights uh, an embodied understanding. Totally, totally. It's true that it's a very Asian. Uh, it's not by chance that all those traditions are coming from from a Asia. I, well, I guess I don't know. Sufism might might be at one point. I guess all all practices, in, including religious practices, were embodied. But uh, yeah, definitely Asian is very embodied. And like they don't choose; they can choose. That that's you know, like it's like it's it's neither. Uh, body neither mind it's 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 both all all the time and it's true like we have in our culture of course you know it's it's um it's intellectual or it's a doing it's the thinking or it, it's the doing and it's a um yeah it touched to the core of what what will what what our culture will will, will become the, the 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 capacity not just to uh, say like if you do you will have a consequence but to shift to that it's it, it's a little bit what you're saying like that what, by doing um it's not even that we will be able to i don't know translate insight in in intellectual thing it might be that we might not be aware of the insight that it brings however our brain which is totally uh, attach uh, and and alive with the with the embodiment will produce different perception of the world or or will produce different capacity to receive the world and from that uh, of course different action so for me it's it's a it's a very very core core conversation of the transition because it it comes back to the question that from where what is the source of our actions it is the moral it is the ethic is it the law is it the you know good and bad perception that that we have or is this something completely out, outside of this picture which is like um from the our capacity to relate basically our capacity to be alive in the sense of uh yeah relating to to all what it is including the the the, the object and you know all the contact uh, that we have that we we um a natural arisement of um what we co consider an adjusted action or just an action a natural arisement of what we feel to do will merge and I really have faith in that kind of action. So mm -hmm. yes, uh, it's. Um, yeah. And I, I have like 
uh, two more questions, I believe, for you. One is you said that, you know, a while ago, one of your panic attacks were your inability to prioritize. And through being able to start sitting, you've been able to start putting order. And I love what you say in like, it's not order in terms of hierarchy, but like things have a home and, uh, and your actions have a home. And what would you say are your current priority in life? Well, what comes, it's to be, to be alive, to be fully alive, but, but um, in a and sense. And how does that show up? Maybe. That's it, that's it. Like to recreate, and that's why we are so passionate about the Praxis Hub, to recreate the context, the condition that we believe will enable a group because I don't believe that you can be fully alive by yourself. So um, uh, what are the conditions? So my passion would be that and my priority, my passion is like, how can we create um, condition, uh, including physical uh, space uh, to, to activate uh, each people who would be in this ecosystem uh, to, to live um, accordingly to their um, inner nature. Uh, how can we, uh, so there is a lot of layers in that, you know, how can we live with the collective trauma? How can you re regulate the collective trauma? How can we help deconstructing the fixed self to, to step in in a, in a collective self without uh, uh, forgetting our individuality. So there is a lot of layers and basically we're working. What is, I, I, I like, like what is the minimum viable practices, the MVP to have this kind of, of group um, functioning together, but not just function is being activated in a sense, thanks to the, to the community that they feel more alive, that when they look at a flower, wow, they, they see the flower. When they, when they eat, wow, they see, you know, the depth and the ancestors and not just intellectually, but because they are a, 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 a mix uh, uh, art, articulation, which is a, a little bit hold by the guardian that we are there. There is two and three guardian when there is people, the facilitators coming, but um, mostly also emergent, but with a fixed frame, a minimum fixed frame. Uh, and so us, if I yeah. recreate is like, what is your priorities as being fully alive and creating experiences for people to be ex able to experience life fully? And and what and what is uh, and what are and you're experimenting with that. It's not like you have fully found the answer, and you're kind of creating iteration yes. To, yes. to figure out how can you live life really awaken to life. Exactly, That's because what amazing. we found so, so far in the community building sphere, I mean, there is so much uh, things you can, as as humanity group, we want to to engage in that kind of project. There is so many things, so. But most of them are, in, sorry? Yeah, it's more because I want to maybe have enough time for the last question. Okay. Sorry, and sorry, sorry. We go, like, I want to focus also on your path, Valérie, versus okay. like what's yeah, going yeah, on. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll cut that. <laughs> um, like, yeah. I, so for me, I guess my last question to you, Valérie, which before we started recording, um, we, we actually briefly mentioned a dimension of faith, that it requires faith to undertake such um, life path, I guess. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about what is faith for you and how do you practice that faith? Um, well, I guess, maybe yeah. to start with, what do you have faith in? Oh, easy life uh, definitely simple answer but easy but what does it mean well I would come back to what you said before like you said like I was not um, a traditional monk in the in the you know in the world however uh, in monasteries 
However, we, we take the same vows. And, and, and when we take the vows of monk, I could, um, I could simplify it like we, we say like we, we leave the house, like technically speaking, like the monk were leaving their family. But of course, it's much more um, deeper than that. It's like when you make the, the, the vow to be a monk in the um, Buddhism, um, you make the vow to leave all what you think about yourself. You, 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 you make the vow to, <clears throat> to, to leave or at least to, to, con to consider that it's, it's, uh, in, it's an illusion, a moment a true in the context, but moment at, m not a truth, like what you believe, the perception, the, all the perception of, of your view, like you, you engage in this kind of movement, you engage in the movement of a constant deconstruction, reconstruction, you know, like this jump in, in life, basically, where you don't, you don't fix things. So I would say that my faith is in these vows, and in these vows, the, 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 what I believe is that the fact that I engage in a movement, fully engage, receiving what comes, uh, mostly being in the illusion, uh, no problem, but engaging in the movement that, um, yeah, nothing will be stopped, including death. And uh, um, that's, I would say that um, I believe that you, basically when you stop, project, if, if you engage this way, that's what I was saying, you, you have to stop projecting systematically what you think and others and our, and our the view. And I believe that if you have this capacity and you cultivate, don't say that I have always this capacity, but if you cultivate this capacity as one of your personal priority, there is good chance or there is better chance that you adjust to what comes to the world. And when it comes to, to, to group, I have faith that if I don't say that everybody should engage this way, but definitely engagement for me is the key word in the transition. The more people will jump in their, you know, own mistrust or whatever with, with the faith that the movement in itself will um, adjust ourselves as a group. Uh, yeah, I, I have faith in that. I don't know what it will bring, but I have faith in that. Mm. The unknown. I have faith in the unknown, but in a dynamic way, not in a, oh, I have faith in the unknown. You know, I, I have faith in the yes. unknown as long as I'm jumping in. Yes. So I think why liking what you're saying, because some people can take um, a dimension of Buddhism as a form of like nihilism or uh, oh. like kind of, oh, whatever, the movement of life, it's going to happen. And it's a kind of retreat from it, mm. disengagement from it. And what I like in what you're saying is like, oh, you you believe in the movement of life, and that's why you jump into the movement of life, contributing to the movement of life. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's actually a very important distinction because those Buddhist uh, teaching can be misunderstood or misinterpreted to serve a certain passivity. Uh, of like well you know if you take it to me like whatever human being will eventually die or the earth will eventually die so you know let's just keep like why do we need to change whereas it's a faith in life and then and in, an act of faith is a is also an engagement uh in life yeah, totally. um, and, and, and I would be a little bit uh, politically incorrect. I, I believe that what could happen in, in spiritual uh, environment, like you, you, you're jumping in a, in a frame which uh, is understood very clearly intellectually that yes, you, you, you shouldn't be attached. You shouldn't, but you, the context is so comfortable in some way because you, you are in a spiritual context that you start to believe that you're there in some way. And, and I see that uh, a lot and not only, you know, like, of course there is a, but I feel it's not even uh, coming from, from the choice of the people. I feel to have very identified um, 
a spiritual place sometimes could be in, in, in productive because the definition, for example, of a place of practice is the same as the vow of the monk. A place of practice is a place of uh, sans demeure. Sans demeure in French would be uh, meaning yeah. it's, it's not a home. Like it's a home, but it's a home because it's not your home. It's not a comfortable place, you know, like, and, and every time you feel so comfortable in your sitting, in your practice, you should be very <laughs> careful and you might be uh, almost certain that you're not there because it's so, you've, you have recreated the, the, the home as a, as a practice is a constantly burning the home, burning, burning the home and, you know, um, and building the home and burning and so yeah, 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 definitely the, 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 the yeah, the, the, the movement. Yeah, yeah the, the movement. comfort is a, uh, is one of the greatest prison. It's, um, uh, it's, it's totally human. It's totally, and it's, you know, it's always, it's, we have to be careful, of course, with those big concepts because it's always the relative and the absolute. So, of course, it's totally normal that a, a family needs to have what they need and 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 work for that. But um, I would say it's just when we then when we engage in the world with with this um, safety, with this comfort. Uh, yeah, just being able also to to know that it might not last or that it's. Yeah. The vulnerability, yes, basically, yes. bringing yeah, back and I think vulnerability. In, in the two terms you just used, it's a good distinction between safety and comfort. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah you're right. We, we, I think one of the, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, that we need safety, but yeah. we do not need comfort. Exactly. And I would say the same with food, you know, like sometime I get, well, so I know that, uh, you know, we're all different in the path and I'm in the food vision since a while. So I had time to, to think about it. But sometimes I'm a bit uh, annoyed when people are talking about, oh, we have so much abundance, so much abundance. And you're like, the tables are like you're 10, there is food for 25. And it's like, no, it's not abundance. It's like <laughs> too much. It's like uh, more, more, more. So we have also confusing, yeah, comfort and safety abundance and uh, gavage i don't know how do you say maybe, no, maybe. Yeah, basically great yeah exactly exactly so yeah and all that adjustment i don't see that it can be made by um, explanation or by another moral ethic even if it's the best spiritual one as you said as we were talking it has to come from a religious experience at, at the at the deep core of what means a religion separated from the dysfunctionality of religions, but the religious experience is basically, um, yeah, become by 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 this deep connection with that with everything, and then we just take what is enough for us because we don't need to take more either in food, in money, in sex, in a relationship, in uh, being able to not do anything, you know, greed with our uh filling up our schedule which is uh you know we, we amazing have... well thank you so much valerie i felt this conversation was very full uh in the density of the food you know uh of the emotional and intellectual food is there anything else you'd like to add before we complete uh our conversation Life is great. So let's, uh, I know there is a lot of uh, problem, but um, if we keep this deep joy of, uh, you know, being alive, um, I think um, we are, we would be able to master everything to get to I want to really acknowledge you, Valérie, for your dedication into this path and into the, an out of ordinary path. And especially in the climate where a lot of people have a lot of anxiety and fear of life, fear of being alive. Um, it really takes something to show that we can engage in life joyfully, to be out of the ordinary in that sense of maybe not like in the success and the achievement, but a different path than what would normally be. 
so thank you for being the slide of showing that a, a different path, an extraordinary path is possible for all of us today and for humanity. Yeah, the, the, the extraordinary of the ordinary to be human together. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's a great way for, to finish our call. Thank you, everybody, for listening to us. I hope you got as much as I did out of this conversation. And I look forward to have a, another Once Upon a Time story with uh, another of our members of community. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.